Okay, so good morning, everybody, and welcome to the next of our In Conversation with uh, series. I am delighted uh, today to welcome Sadie Ashton, Business Improvement Manager from Balfour Beating. Hi, Sadie. How are you? Hi, Dan. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Where are you at the moment then? I'm in Edinburgh. In Edinburgh. And yeah. Just to just to kind of fill everybody in. So was that a recent move for you? Was that something that you did quite recently or have you been in Edinburgh for quite some time? No, it's in lockdown. So I'm from Surrey, uh, down south in England. And then I moved to the Midlands um, in 2011. And then I moved in lockdown, moved back down to Surrey and then moved to Edinburgh to live with my partner. So I've been all over, but... Um, yeah, I think I'm settled now in Edinburgh. Oh, good. And how has how has this whole year for for you personally? I know obviously you've done a lot of moving, which is fantastic. You've been able to do that in lockdown. But how has how have, how have you been feeling? How are you? Well, I'm doing really well, thank you. I, I know it isn't the case for everyone, but lockdown's actually been really positive for me. It's the start of lockdown was when I started this new role um, and it had been discussed for a while about me moving into the role but there was never an official date for it and then when lockdown happened I thought oh this will just be pushed down the road but it wasn't and it was actually seen as this is a really important time for me to take on this role um, with the challenge that Covid's brought to every business um, for us it kind of gave an opportunity to look at how we can improve um what we can do to come out the other side a bit better mm -hmm. in a new normal world uh, so it's been really positive for me and luckily 99 percent of my family and friends haven't got covid and those that have have had it really sort of light so touch wood it's all been all been pretty positive for me oh fantastic and i think what you just said there resonates with everybody because when we were doing our sessions last year for the forum, we very much focused on about how do we get through COVID? How do we, how can we support each other to get through it? But one thing that we particularly wanted to focus on as a forum this year was how do we, what's it going to look like as we come out of it, you know? So it's really interesting to see, I think that you've had this opportunity to start thinking about that, those processes that can be put in place to do that as well. And we were, myself and Sadie were talking because she's had a fantastic opportunity here. Um, you've been an executive assistant, you've moved through now to become a business improvement manager. And whilst these sessions we've had, you know, we do celebrate the PA and EA role. Um, we are just highlighting different opportunities that have been given to people, particularly over the last year or two. And the reason we're doing that is because a lot of people are, you know, we've had some sensitive times with roles being made redundant, lots of movement within business, lots of restructuring. And a lot of PAs and EAs want to think, what else can I do to enhance my role? What sort of things can I do? So take us back, Sadie, to where it all started. What happened? Where, why, did you, why did you choose to come into this industry? Well, <laughs> it's taking me back a while now, but um, <laughs> I started my career back in 2005, age 17, sort of fresh out of school. I'd done a year GMVQ in business studies when I left school. And then I thought, you know what, I just want to go straight to work in. Um, so I got my first job as a receptionist and it was for a construction company in South London. I had no idea what I wanted to do long term. I had no sort of aspirations at that time I thought oh, I'll figure it out later kind of thing um, but it was in that role where I looked up to a PA and said that that was what I was going to do it was somebody that I had seen have a great relationship with the CEO she and I was terrified of him you know that kind of someone so senior when you're so young and naive I was petrified of him for no reason and I thought that was such a great relationship that she had and she must learn so much from him I loved how glamorous she was and watching her work typing away all day thinking why is it that she's doing and with no sort of technical reasons decided that was what I was going to do <laughs> so from there I started a home learning course um, which took uh, a year to complete or was due to take a year and I moved into a reception management role which was the most boring job I've ever had it was quiet there was nothing to do and I raised it several times and was just told you know just kind of get on with it so I thought well I'm going to use this time so I studied and completed the course within five months and then was wanted to you know put all of that training that I'd completed into action so I then 
got my first PA role in 2007. Mm -hmm. And it was really there where I kind of put all of that learning into practice. And it was a communications company that I worked for, but it was there as I kind of learned as I went, um, kind of created the role that I wanted to have or what I had envisioned, you know, the role of a PA was. Um, And then in 2008, I had my first, what I would call traditional proper PA role. Um, which was extremely varied. It was PA, it was office management. That was also a time coming out the back of the recession as well, where there were a lot of job vacancies, where there just weren't people doing jobs. So my role then moved into doing a bit of HR. It moved into doing a monthly newsletter, um, actually like doing some payroll. It was extremely varied, but it gave me such great skills and experience. And I really enjoyed that job. And from then, I think I've probably kind of anticipated every role that I wanted to have should have a bit more of a, you know, well-rounded experience. Yeah. And I think you've nailed it there in, you know, going back to that um, job when you were a receptionist and you saw the PA to the CEO tapping away and what was she doing all day I think you kind of had that understanding then of all those different types of things that she was probably managing for him and and all the different skill sets that she was using as well so yeah it's it's it's, you you do work in quite a male dominated environment don't you Mm -hmm. how is that well I mean construction has always felt like a bit of a natural fit for me anyway growing up all of the men in my family were either, were physical workers builders roofers plasterers everything so after school I was often dragged onto you know my dad's sites with him wherever he was working so I was quite comfortable in that environment but you know you have to be competent in any environment that you work in and to succeed in any career but I've probably just been fortunate in the businesses that I've worked for. They've all been really diverse businesses. And from what, you know, from what I've seen with the women working around me and women in construction, even though it's a male dominated industry, these women haven't had to work twice as hard to, or be twice as competent to get anywhere, which I think is quite important. Um, And I think working for diverse businesses as well, it's, the business that want to be diverse and I think if if your businesses aren't then that's something that you can get involved with and support mm. um communicate why diversity is important and ultimately the lack of women in construction is kind of it's not a woman's problem it's a business problem but the as I say I've just been very lucky with the businesses that I've worked for that it hasn't been yeah an I issue. Think, yeah I think there's there are lots of groups out there that do celebrate women in construction. Um, I know that there's there's some active groups in Birmingham particularly, um, and, and they're fantastic. And I just think, again, it kind of highlights something there that if you've got a role and you're trying to enhance that role, what sorts of initiatives can you think of doing? And diversity and inclusion is something that's huge at the moment. Um, you know, after last year, lots of different events highlighted that. And I think that's something that's really important, but particularly, yes, women in construction um, is, a, is a really big thing. So um, what's the assistant network like at Balfour BT? Have you got quite a broad network? Is there quite a lot of you or how, how do you how do you work together? Well, um, I would say there are a lot of assistants just because of the size and scale of the business as a whole. The assistance network within Balfour BT is probably not as well shaped as it could be. Um, and that's a really interesting question, actually, because when I worked in my regional business, so I worked for Balfour BT, one part of it is UK construction. And then underneath that, I worked for the regional North and Midlands business. Um, and in that, we probably had 10 to 15 assistants throughout the business. So I would always have quite a a learning session each month with those assistants and we'd invite someone in to show us a system that we weren't really competent in or we'd invite a specialist to the meeting um, but outside of that there probably wasn't much of a network um, so it's definitely something that Balfour BT should look at as a wider piece but there's lots of different businesses so I, I think it probably would dilute perhaps you know the, the yeah. purpose of having it uh, but there is something we could do within UK construction certainly. Yeah, I think it's 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 actually really challenging. I think some of the feedback that we've had in the past to try and sit, set up an internal 
um, assistant network, particularly when you're in such a vast company that's got so many different people working in different areas. And I think one thing particularly I'm really passionate about this year is to try and champion that as well, too, because it's just so great when you get you go into um, a company. Uh, we did a, recently a, a presentation to Birmingham University and it was it was fantastic. It was great to see so many people. There was, I think there was like 32 assistants there and it was really great. So no, it's, it's, it's always something that we think that different members might try to consider again championing that within their organizations this year because again it's something new and something that people would probably really appreciate as well so yeah and I think say? especially with COVID as well it's really needed as with everybody feeling extremely excluded I know that I did when I first you know when the first lockdown happened everyone felt really excluded in their own home so it's a perfect time for those sort of networks to be set up so it's definitely something I'll take away yeah I'm going to I'm going to ask you a little bit of a curveball question here because something that we always kind of get asked is so when you have the, the kind of job title as PA and you've also had the job title as EA how did that when was that transition what happened there was there was it just because you work in a different part of the business or supporting somebody different I to be honest I think it was me that made that change I think at the time it was probably my second PA role at Ringway and they just you know they they didn't have much experience they just asked for a PA and I got the job and came in and did all the PA duties but then little did I know that role would then expand into lots of other things and it was at that point where I said this isn't really a PA role I'm doing a bit of everything here I'm doing everything to support my two executives that I worked for and that was at a time when I'd just done my executive PA diploma and it really focused on the difference between PA and EA and I know that's not sort of something that um, is still the case because that you know there is a lot of duplication in those roles but it was a time when I thought executive assistance is more senior than a personal assistant and that was kind of what I thought would look more stand out on my CV moving forward or with regards to the level of people that I would support so I asked for that to be changed it was actually executive assistant and office manager I was very particular about that change in my job title <laughs> um, but it was me that, that asked for that change I would say and I think having the confidence to lead those types of discussions is is you know we always again here those those moments when you're having your you know mid-year review or your pay review etc and having the confidence to build up and and shape your role into kind of what you want it to be um is really but it's one of the biggest I think one of the biggest challenges is always what's the difference between a PA and an EA and that's such a difficult question to answer because it's so different in such different organizations isn't it, it is. so did, did your diploma really help you then with all those different skills do you know what I would say <clears throat> it probably did help me but not for the reasons that you would think I think it helped me because I probably didn't have any idea on what a PA did um, when I took on the course uh, so it taught me what that role was and it then taught me what that role would be capable of doing it probably didn't necessarily give me the skills to do that I think I learned that on the job um, I kind of figured things out as I went so I was probably very inexperienced when I got my first job, but that was the time where I kind of picked it up as I went. So what, what type of things do you do now to keep yourself kind of up to date with, with things? Do you still do? Do you have much, uh, you know, do you, um, does the, do they invest a lot of education for you or are you very much kind of self-sufficient, mm -hmm. like to go out and kind of source things yourself as and when you need it? Do you have anything that's going on at the moment to kind of support your learning? Yes, at the moment I'm doing... A project management qualification or I will be doing very shortly um, and that is supported by the business that I work for and that was kind of part of the uh, the package of me taking on this new role so that's really going to give me strong stronger skills um, to do my role more effectively but the role that I do at the moment is mainly around sort of though that stakeholder engagement knowing who these people are you know running the projects is more of a coordination aspect that I do um, which I'm sure we'll touch on later, but it's the the training isn't necessary for me in this role, I would say, because yeah. a lot of the skills I already have, but the training is certainly going to help me in the future and however my role develops. Fantastic. So what would you say is your, what's your, what's your biggest achievement as an EA? What would you say was your biggest achievement within your role? Um, this is a really tough question, but 
I would say my line manager that I worked with before who nominated me for um, the PA awards uh, the last two years, he's always said that my most outstanding achievement was how I would get recognized by my colleagues for the work that I have done mm. um, and my professionalism and my dedication to getting, you know, seeing tasks through to the end, sort of when people ask you to do something, it gets done. Um, but my biggest achievement and not just within Balfour BT, I would say is kind of helping my colleagues change their view on EAs and PAs and what they're capable of. Um, so it's something I'm really strongly passionate about. I think long gone are the days where PAs are just there waiting for you to tell them what meetings you need and make a cup of tea. You know, all of those sort of things is what people think. But really, we're supporting people at a senior leadership level and working alongside people at that level. And it's kind of the traditional duties are no longer there. We yeah. kind of make the roles what they need to be and cover other roles that, that are required. So I would say that's kind of been my biggest achievement is changing the views on what an EA does. I will, I've got to say, obviously, with the awards over the past two years, it's been it has been fantastic to see how supportive your business is to you, because we you know, um, when we encourage people to put applications forward year after year, you know, we appreciate the executives are busy and they might not necessarily have the chance to be as detailed as as they can be. But it's it really was it was fantastic to read how much detail they went into and how much they appreciated everything that you do. And I think you should be really proud of that because it's fantastic. How did that make you feel? Oh, I am. Um, I was so chuffed with it because it's something that I did before in actually maybe it's been three years. I can't remember. But the year before I did it. Um, and it was in my old job and it was a very sort of I felt like I was having to like ask for it and ask to be nominated whereas the last two years it's been a lot more of a, a recognition of the work that I've kind of put in and I was completely blown away with the um, I asked the CEO and my managing director that I supported to do me a quick video of like what my role had kind of brought to them and um, and how sort of thankful they were. And I was really blown away by the responses. They were two lovely videos that I will sort of cherish. And um, I would really like look back on those with really fond memories of how I could support and make someone else's life a bit easier. That's fantastic. Oh, that's brilliant. I didn't realize that. That's, that's amazing. That I think, again, to have that support, and that's something that can be built over time. Um, some people feel very nervous. You know, we all don't like to kind of self-promote or write about ourselves. So when you get that recognition coming in from somebody else and you know that you've been supporting those people so much, it must be just really rewarding. So congratulations to you. Thank you. So what would you suggest then in the current climate that we're in, <clears throat> as we were saying at the beginning of the call, a lot of um, PAs, EAs, business support professionals are looking to try and enhance their roles. What sort of things do you think that they could be doing or that you could, you know, share to, to, to kind of help them with those different ideas and suggestions? And also how putting those forward to try and make sure that that does happen? Well, I think, I think progression routes for anyone with the PA, EA environment, if they want to progress out of those sort of roles, what is out there is as varied as the job itself. Um, I don't think there's any other profession like a PA that has such a varied job description. Um, but the advice I, I think I would give you if you wanted to elevate your roles is ask, ask for more responsibility, ask for other duties to take on, ask to get involved in projects without dropping any balls. I think that's what I've always done over the years is kind of if I wanted to be recognized for the work is take it on as much as I physically could without cracking and try not to drop any balls along the way. And I'm sure I have sometimes, but then it's just how quickly you can cover them up before anybody notices. Um, but what I did was I started looking at gaps around me, gaps in teams um, that I could fill on an interim or part-time basis. Um, I looked at my CV and highlighted kind of some skills that I had and where I could use those whether that was, you know, doing a monthly newsletter before I could, I had InDesign skills, what can I do to get involved there? And, and kind of, if that was something that interested me, work on that a bit, bit more. And it wasn't luckily, but um, I think everyone would be really, everyone that wanted to really look at their CV in detail would be so surprised at the skills and experience that we have. Um, 
but it, it kind of takes a bit of a deep dive into that to have a look. But that's where you're going to look at your CV and see what you can, where you can branch off into. Um, did you sorry. have to rewrite? Sorry, say, did you have to rewrite your CV for this job? I didn't for this job, but I looked at. I looked at my CV because I kind of explained what I wanted to move into by saying I wanted a role. I wasn't specific. I said I wanted to move into a role that was going to develop my leadership capability, is going to improve the performance of the people in the business that I work for. Um, it's going to give me a new challenge. It's going to push me out of my comfort zone. Uh, it's going to learn and develop and broaden my knowledge and skills. That's kind of what I asked for. And then a business improvement manager is what I became. But it's the role that I'm now in has given me all of those that all of that challenge and what I was looking for. So that's kind of the brief I gave. And then once I reviewed my CV, I kind of looked at where I could move into. Yeah, because I think I, I think it. it's I think it's really interesting actually when you do go back and some of us haven't updated our CVs for years. And so when you do go back in it and start updating it. Um, somebody asked me for my CV the other day and I was like I haven't done my CV for two years <laughs> but looking back and trying to build that and thinking about all the different things that you've done uh, and all the things that you do and making a physical note of those things as you're going through your role it's a mind-blowing to see how much you actually do isn't it it is so tell us then how did how did this come about this role what was there an internal vacancy was it something that you approached them to to talk about was it something that you could hear whispers around the the business about what we need what they needed did you identify it as a as a, an area of growth what what kind of happened there so with the change in my role it was kind of I I don't want to say I was bored because I wasn't I had a job that I've been doing for the last two and a half years I was very settled in my role but I wasn't really being challenged anymore and the things that I was doing you know I've been doing for the last two and a half years there was no new challenge coming from it so I had a chat with my managing director who's always been really supportive of me and just said Tim look I need something a bit more and he said you know what more do you want and before I had wanted to get into project management. However, project management means something completely different in the world that I work in. And it means like building 300 million pound hospitals um, and stuff like that. So it was a bit like, you're not qualified to do that, but um, really supported me and looked at what gaps there were in the business and where I could fill. And it was, he kind of asked around um, and the CEO that I worked quite closely with before, he was really supportive as well in finding a role that was going to sort of retain me within the business. And that's how this role came about. So it was a role that was going to give me a project management from our perspective um, role. It's business improvement. It's managing sort of internal projects rather than large scale development projects. Um, it's always something that I've been really passionate about with business improvement through various sort of things I've done in the past um, and project management. I'm sure like every PA and EA, we've all done it. It's managing an event for 10 people or managing an event for a thousand people. I would class that as internal project management. So it was something, it was a skill that I was confident that I had, I could grow on and grow into my new role. So, so, so we, I'm just imagining now, so, so you, they basically created this role for you, you didn't have to interview it or, you know, there wasn't anybody else in the business. So day one, what happened on day one when you, <laughs> when you started? Well, that, that's what I mean. It was a role that was created for me and it was all kind of discussed. It wasn't really any, um, it wasn't a role that I had to interview for. It wasn't a role that was replacing anyone. It was a role that was created, which was a really nice feeling because I felt like the business had created a role to retain me um, however I had no idea what I was going to be doing <laughs> so um, a large part of the role that I was employed to do was to oversee our employee engagement channel which is called my contribution which is where all of the employees in the business if they have any ideas on how we can improve the business put them into this channel and then it's about how we manage that process um, there's lots of different teams that physically process the ideas um, and my role is to kind of oversee that for the part of the business that I work for so that's half my role and then the other half is managing the sort of internal improvement projects that we have. Fantastic and how's that how has that been working remotely and getting everybody together has that been and have you had to try and get a lot of buy-in from everybody? 
I'd say it's actually been really positive for me being like working remotely because the nature of the projects that I've been managing and it's easy to get hold of people because everyone's working from home and everyone's working remotely and everyone's working longer hours than they ever have done before. So it's been really positive, but I don't think I would have been able to do that had I not have had such great relationships with the people that I work with. And I was always quite lucky, even though I worked in a regional business, that I was quite well known through the business and had really great connections. So I've been able to use those really well in my new role. Um, and it's and it's benefited being at home. A lot of people knew kind of who I was and I knew a lot of the people that I would then need to speak to. Um, so it's just building on those relationships, really. But it's worked well being at home. I think I'm really interested as well if, in the chat box, because just to see kind of how you how our audience today have kind of got on. Do you feel like your communication has improved while you've been working from home or do you feel like it's it's been more challenging for you? I'm just really interested to see what people um what the kind of consensus is in the chat box because it's interesting to hear that Sadie that you know you have been able to get hold of people people have maybe maybe more accessible but there are other people out there that feel you know that they might not have had had that as well so yeah do, do drop us in the chat box because I'd love to be able to see that if that's all right um and then uh yeah so so from that then what sort of aspirations do you have for the future? Have you put like a lot of plans in place for 2021 and what are you kind of thinking of beyond that as well? I haven't actually, do you know, that's not something I've thought of and it's been deliberate because I think I'm not sure where I see my role evolving right now because currently I feel very sort of green in the role that I'm doing. So I'm, my focus is on learning and expanding on the, those skills that I've learned and putting, you know, studying again and then putting them back into practice and sort of highlighting any areas that I am going to be weak on moving forward into, a, you know, not permanent role, but a kind of a bigger role or more responsibility or other members of the team. So that's kind of what I'm focusing on. I don't really know what the role will revolve, will mm. evolve into in the future, but I'm excited to kind of see how it goes. I know, definitely. Well, we've got in the chat box here, so um, we've already got some people in the audience that have got business improvement objectives within their role. So that's fantastic. Um, people feel like they can communicate communicate better with colleagues and external stakeholders. Um, uh, definitely more challenging. It's harder on Teams and Zoom. I think that's a great point because um, it's it's very difficult, I think, to get the create because the creative juices go in, isn't it? On when you're online, normally you'd be sat around a table, lots of cup of coffees and cakes, and you know a little bit of snacks or whatever, and everyone's, you know, having a brain a brain session together. Whether we're just kind of putting loads of ideas together, I think sometimes that can be quite challenging online. Do you think? Yeah. I think it can. I miss the good old days of sitting around the table with cakes <laughs> and coffee. <laughs> and, and, and body language as well. Um, so many, you know, people have, have discussed with us before. They want us to try and do a session on projecting body language over Zoom. I mean, I'm very much a hand hands person. I think everybody knows that. Um, <laughs> but it's like, and you know, you just can't get up and move around and like show your passion and excitement for something as much as you could do before. So uh, we've got, we agree with Sadie, communication has been easier um, uh, to liaise with senior partners, uh, senior leaders and partners of the business who travel around the world, exactly for a, a global company as well. I get, I guess the travel time has gone, you know, potentially. It'd be really interesting to see what happens after this and how people work because I used to drive like, hundreds of miles every month and I don't think I'll be doing that again now it's mad no, I hope not but I, I, I do agree I think the time that we've spent commuting but it's, it's such a catch-22 situation because I, I I don't know about everybody else but I really find that I'm working I might be working the same hours sort of half eight till five but it's so more intense if that's the only time I work, it's so intense. It's not like you're, you're nipping off and you can have a chat or you're getting breaks from your desk. You're at your desk in your office for that time solidly. But then it's the argument, if you're traveling two hours in the morning and two in the evening, do you then put that into work or do you put that into yourself so that you're then, you know, better, bringing a better version to work? Yeah, no, exactly. And um, we've uh, we've got all the changes within the business. Um, uh, 
there's been a lot of senior leadership, a lot of senior leadership changes. I've had to reach out for more via email and request catch up and calls. Um, so yeah, there's, I think there's just been, we've all adapted to that communication style, but I'm just going to find it really interesting to see what happens when all of this is over. How is it going to, you know, how is that going to happen? Are we going to go back to the office? Or what are the office? What's the office environment going to look like? Will we be working from home a lot more? I think that the, the myth of trust has gone now, kind of, you know, where people used to challenge working from home. I think somebody said yesterday, you only used to be able to go home sometimes if there was a, you know, an important delivery coming or you needed a doctor's appointment or to go, you know, if, they, if you've got children, et cetera. But now, whether that flexibility is going to be there, I mean, do you, is that something that you would see for Balfour Beatty in the future? It definitely is. And I completely, we were not a very work from home company. Um, and the company I was at previously, they went through a big merge and um, moved moved the office somewhere off site and then gave the people lots more flexibility with regards to working from home. And that was really important and really good to see that business being so far advanced in their work from home policies. But then coming into Balfour Beatty, it's not that it was frowned upon, it just wasn't a done thing. I think, you know, it's an engineering company. So a lot of people are in the office. It just wasn't sort of a, I wouldn't say it wasn't acceptable, but it just wasn't done. Um, and I enjoyed going into the office every day, I'll be honest. So when it changed and everyone was working from home, I think everyone just adapted to it. And But I do I do agree with you, Dan. I think there's going to be a lot more trust in the new world and a lot more flexibility with working from home. And rightfully so. I think everyone's proved they can work from home quite effectively and, and make things work because we've had to. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Do you think that's something that would fall within your role um, in the future in terms of looking at that kind of... The, the, taking that as an as a project potentially about you know I think when we go back to the office it's going to be a lot of restructuring moving things around making sure that they're safe and do you think that might fall under you or do you think that might fall towards more the office managers or um, well that has already been done so our offices are still open just for those that can't work from home um, and we have had a few sort of critical workers you know going out to work so the office managers have taken on that role one of the projects that I was involved in at the start of lockdown was actually analyzing our offices looking at our office space that we had when our leases were due to expire do we actually need all of these offices moving forward um, that was one of the first projects that um, that I sort of helped coordinate and start right at the beginning of lockdown. So that was interesting. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think, again, that begs the question, you know, especially for the larger companies that have got multiple offices, either nationally, globally, how is that going to be, you know, in the future? So, yeah, that's one definitely we need to hold on to our seats for, I think. But we've got here in the chat box... Um, that yes, like like you say, do offered skills um, to help other departments with projects, um, like the hub in the office, uh, getting involved with many different opportunities. Um, many times I've been told my CV was to uh, cast, I would be overqualified for a normal PAEA role. Um, so there's lots of hybrid offices going on um, with some people going into the office a couple of days a week. So, yeah, it's interesting to see what different stages I think that people are at right now. So if you had kind of words of wisdom going forward to kind of with everybody today, what would you, in the, given the current climate that we're in, what's happened with you, with your role, how you're feeling at the moment? What kind of words of wisdom do you think you could offer our audience today? Well, I mean, I'm not very wise, but my, my words of wisdom would just sort of be that don't put limits on what you're capable of achieving. Um, PA skills make us all so versatile and so well-rounded and experienced. There's so much that we are capable of doing. Um, and if you, you wanted to branch out from your current role, I think you'll learn that there is nothing quite like introducing yourself as you and nobody else, um, which I I'm finding very, very bizarre. But um, I think it's quite nice to be able to do that. So they would be my words of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> Ish. If you've got any questions for Sadie, um, please do pop those into the chat box because I'd love to be able to ask those for you. Is this the first type of interview that you've done, Sadie, before like this? Yeah. It is. And you know what? I think uh, just touching on a point you said earlier, I I've never been good at presenting or um, me personally presenting or like public speaking skills. But this environment working from home has actually been really good for me because it's so much easier to sit behind a screen and present. 
it's that I'm hoping when the new world comes and I'm back out in offices and seeing people that I am more confident in speaking. Um, so that's definitely sort of an area of weakness of mine that I'm sort of looking to improve. But I really hope that this time will give me a bit more confidence. I think I think the virtual uh, delivering things virtually has definitely helped to grow people's confidence because you know there's more opportunities to you might want to put something in the chat box you might want to you know sometimes if you're in a meeting raise the hand or you know and, and have that opportunity to put yourself forward and speak and particularly when there's so many different personalities if you've got some quite overwhelming personalities sometimes it can be quite difficult you know to to put your point across so I think the screen has almost acted as like a comfort blanket to us, hasn't it? Which has been really great to be able to do that. Yeah, so definitely. Um, so as a PA and operations manager, the perfect combination would be a mix of both working from home and in the office. Face-to-face -face contact for collaborate, uh, collaborative working is essential, but then the quiet times at home for processing to undertake that work. Like say to the operations manager role definitely resulted as a... Um, as a result of the varied PA role I've undertaken, the skill set from a PA role. I think that's another thing, an, op an operations manager role. Again, we've got project manager, operations manager. Again, these, these types of roles are things that people are really, really interested in now. I mean, just again, in the chat box, I'd love to see how many of you are considering project management courses, because I think that's something that, like you said, Sadie is, is is really something that people are looking to do aren't they at the moment I think the Prince 2 is out there isn't it that's quite a in-depth project management um call yeah. that, is that what you're doing something like that I did my I did my Prince 2 a couple of years ago um like three years ago but I never actually sat the qualification so I did all the online training never sat the exam um just due to time pressures so but that was something I funded myself I think all of my training I have actually self-funded um apart from this training, I'm going to be doing APM training through the company, which the company are hopefully going to be funding. So, but if, if they're not, then I'll probably just fund it myself. Is that something, I hope you don't mind me asking, but is that something that you just felt like you wanted to fund yourself or, because I think another thing, we've got a session next week actually, which is um, about building a really strong business case to put together, to, to put things forward, to try and implement change. I think sometimes we, we 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 blur the lines between our personal development and professional development when actually it will benefit the business both ways um yeah so so um yeah how did you find prince too yeah it it was um it was definitely tough <laughs> but that's I, I find the online learning environment pretty tough anyway but just to go back to your point as if it, did i self-fund with my first PA diploma when I did that yeah I self-funded because I'm impatient and I was working for a business that wasn't really going to support me to do another role to do a completely different role um, so that's why I did that and with the project management training if I'd asked for it I probably could have got it funded through the business I worked for but it was a really difficult time for the business I felt a bit uncomfortable about asking for for training as the, the you know the business were making lots of redundancies I didn't feel it was appropriate but um and again, I was impatient, so I wanted to do it myself. No, I think I think that's interesting because I think that's where we are now. There's been a lot of restructuring in businesses, and I know with our conference last year, um, I think it was over sixty five percent of people that came paid for the conference themselves, and many of them didn't want to ask because there'd been lots of restructuring within businesses, which is completely fine. But then we also found at Christmas that a lot of companies were, you know, although they'd had a restructuring, they really wanted to look after the people that were still there um, and really make sure that they felt really valued and, you know, that and 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 safe. So it's such mixed feelings and emotions. It is. Isn't it, it is. And also I, I have always felt as if I'm paying for a training course when the business that I'm working for aren't paying for it, but they're going to get the benefits of me having that training. So I think it's a it's a difficult sort of dilemma to have is but I think any investment in yourself is you're going to have for life anyway so exactly and, and I think it's just been great to hear today how supportive Balfour BTR to you you've obviously you know you've got a, you've had a great career with them a great working career coming into this point now and as, as we said at the beginning it's this isn't about trying to encourage people not to be 
a PA or an EA. It's just giving people um, an understanding of the different types of opportunities that they could potentially involve in their role, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I think the heart of all of that is 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 kind of like self belief as well. If that's something you want to do and you believe that you want to, it's not that you're capable. If you believe you want to work in a different role, um, that, that that you have the confidence to to kind of do that. But yeah, it's not easy to be uh, to be confident all the time. No, Sadie is um, part of our mentoring initiative as well, which is uh, fantastic. So if anyone's got any questions or queries and, and want to understand a little bit more about <clears throat> your role and kind of what you're doing, Sadie, are you happy for people to kind of drop you an email, get in touch? Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Well, I just want to say thank you so much. It's been an absolute privilege to see you today, Sadie, all the way up north. I'm sure is it snowing there. Yeah, <laughs> I just said earlier. There's someone skiing out the front down the road, like actually on skis. Oh, we make, we make the most of it. But thank you, <laughs> thank you so much for having me. No, you're very welcome. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, and just uh, to give you, so next week we've got our coffee club on Monday, where we will be joined by the author of the Round Peg Journal, which is a new journal that's just been released. And it's all about your own, building your own self-development within that journal. And then on Wednesday, we've got a session uh, which is all about the business case and building a really strong case within business, whether that be for your role or um, to support you with your role or something that you want to do within your role. So I will send out some details um, later. We'll upload the video onto YouTube as well. So Sadie's kindly agreed for us to do that. So thank you very much, Sadie. Um, and thanks thank everyone, everyone for joining us. Have a fantastic day and we'll catch up with you soon. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.